from this perspective, it seems natural to define a Berry phase for a given band n as the integral from 0 to 2 pi over a or from minus pi over a to pi over a since everything is periodic of the Berry connection of the cell periodic block state. So that's uh, what uh, people sometimes call the Zek phase. So uh, up to now, it doesn't look that much different from the Berry phase. So why does it mer merit a different name? Uh, well, I'm not sure it does. Maybe it does. But there is one, one difference, which I think becomes particularly clear if we look at the discretized version of the Berry phase. So this is now the Brion zone. where the two endpoints are, uh, are identified. And so I can define my block state uh, along this loop. And uh, in analogy with what we discussed before, the question then becomes, can we evaluate this Berry phase in the one-dimensional Brillouin zone by taking uh, the state. So let me introduce uh, some notation that uh, I forgot, which is um, so let's say this is j equals zero, one, uh, two, three, four, five. So n equals five and k equals 0, and k equals 2 pi over a. So I write k So I have a uniform mesh of k points going from one end of the Brillouin zone to the other end. So So can we write the following in complete analogy? So this would be correct if the cell periodic block states were identified between the two ends of the Brillouin zone, right? So this would be correct if u at k equals 2 pi over a would be the same as u at k equals 0. But if you remember, the actual condition that we imposed when I first wrote down block theorem was something like that, but on the size, not on the use. And if you remember that the psi is that the two uh, sets of functions are related by this, then you immediately conclude that uh, this constraint implies for the use a different condition. Okay, and so the logic here was that uh, we wrote on the last overlap u0 because un was the same as u0. So uh, the right prescription is going to be to actually uh, replace un here by this expression on the right hand side. So the last overlap is going to be different from the, uh, the previous ones in the sense that it will contain this exponential in the middle. Okay. 
So that's the discretized Z phase. And you see that there is something funny about it, right? Because it's no longer just an intrinsic property of the, of the set of wave functions, but it also contains the, the coordinate operator X, right? So there is some spatial information that is embedded in this quantity. It's just not a property of the abstract Hilbert space. So it's something that you just have to live with. So that's the right way of defining a geometrical phase on a one-dimensional Brillouin zone. Uh, but it's sort of telling you something, right? It, it's telling you that this quantity may have some uh, special information. It tells you something about uh, the special distribution of electrons uh, uh, in a band, okay? And th that's actually uh, the case, and you can make this statement much more intuitive by introducing uh, Vani functions. So that's the next thing I want to do. So the block functions are the eigenstates, uh, and the Vani functions are just a different representation of the electronic structure of a crystal, which are not energy eigenstates, but uh, uh, nevertheless, they are a valid representation because you can go back and forth between one representation and the other without losing any information. So I'll just give the definition. Again, I'll drop band indices, and I'm working in one dimension so that everything is as simple as possible. So the Vani function is a sort of a Fourier transform of a block function. So for a given band, you take your block states and you do this integral over the entire Brillouin zone uh, of the full block function psi multiplied by this phase factor, which depends on where you are along the one-dimensional Brillouin zone. Okay. And uh, you, can, uh, you can do the inverse transformation. So this gives you the Vani function in terms of all the block functions in a given band, and you can get a block function at a specific k by doing the Fourier, uh, the inverse transformation. Okay. So these are just definitions, uh, which are probably, again, familiar to many of you. And I'll just state uh, very briefly some properties without proof in the interest of time. Uh, the first two you can find in any textbook. <clears throat> so you see what's going on here. So the, the label of a block function is k. And then when you go to the Vanier representation, you integrate over all k. So k disappears as a label. But through this exponential factor, we, we introduce a new label, which is R. So it's a real space label. So block functions are labeled by wave vector in the Brillouin zone, and the uh, Vani functions are labeled by a lattice vector of the real space lattice. So the first property is that uh, the Vani functions are periodic images, the ones with different values of R are periodic images of one another. So you just need to calculate one and you obtain the others by translating by the corresponding lattice vector. Uh, the, other, the second property is that um, uh, these objects are typically localized in real space uh, if a smooth gauge is chosen by the, for the block functions in k-space. So just from basic Fourier theory, uh, you Fourier transform um, a smooth function and you get something that is localized. So, so these are, um, so the nice thing about Vani functions is that you sort of recover chemical intuition uh, in a solid where the eigenstates extend over the entire crystal, but by going into this localized representation, you get something that somehow uh, recovers the atomic picture, if you want, or molecular picture. So 
there are just some functions that are localized uh, on the lattice vectors. X equals plus A, and so forth. Okay. Uh, second property is that uh, they form an orthonormal set. So if you take the the scalar product of two uh, Vining functions with different labels, you get zero, and they are normalized. So if, if it's the same one, you get one. So these are textbook uh, uh, properties. And uh, the one I really want to focus on is the third one. which is the centers of the Vani functions are related to the Zeg phase. So the Zeck phase is a property, a global property of the entire band. And the Vani function was also obtained by integrating over all k. So it's also a global property, if you want, of the band. And uh, it turns out that if you take the, the center of mass, and they are localized orbitals, so we can define their center of mass, unlike for the block functions that are extended. So this first moment is not uh, well defined. But for a Vani function, it is, uh, so I just define it like this. So this is not a cross product now. This is really the position operator. So from property one, that these are just periodic images of one another, I can write this as the center of mass of the Vani function at the home cell, L, uh, R equals zero, plus the R that labels the Vani function. And the neat property is, which I will again state without proof, that the center of the Vani function is given in units of the lattice constant by the Zeck phase over 2 pi. And well, of course, uh, we know that the phase is, uh, can be changed by 2 pi, but that, that then just means that uh, we are shifting the Vani function via lattice vector, and that's just relabeling, essentially. So you shift all of them in the same way, so you're just relabeling the Vani functions. But, uh, um, so what is the physics behind this? So this comes back to what I said before, that the Zeck phase is special in that the position operator appears. So here it appears again, but in a much more transparent way. So this is actually the first moment of the charge distribution of a, of a Vani function. Well, yeah, the, the, the center, right? So that's the, the special information that is encoded. But so what is the physics behind this? Uh, The physics uh, in the case of an insulator is, uh, is very precisely defined. So if you're talking about a valence band of an insulator, and let's say for simplicity there is a single valence band. So this gives you essentially the collective center of mass of the electrons in the field band. Okay? So it's not a property of any given block state, but it's a global property of the entire field band. And it tells you what is the center of mass in the home cell in one of the cells of the electron. So it's an intracell electronic coordinate. Uh, and intuitively, uh, you can imagine that uh, if the center of negative charge, so the electrons are negative, so the cell is neutral because you have electrons and protons, and if the center of this uh, negative charge does not coincide with the center of 
charge of the positive ions, you have a sort of an intracell dipole moment that uh, you can define. And it turns out that uh, this is actually a sharp definition of the electric polarization uh, of an insulating material. So when you have a crystal that breaks inversion symmetry, so typically in three dimensions, you have like a ferroelectric, barium titanate uh, at low temperature. So these systems break inversion symmetry and you have an electric polarization. And that's actually the, uh, the, um, the proper way of, of defining it. So the electric polarization, I will call it P, uh, is the, in one dimension, is the intracell dipole per unit length. And the dipole is going to be, uh, so let's say that we have uh, one band with spin up and spin down election, so we have a factor of two uh, to account for spin degeneracy, is just the difference between the center of the ion, ionic charge inside the cell, so the, the nuclei in the unit cell, minus the center of the Vania function uh, in the home cell. Okay, so you have positive charges, you have negative charges. Uh, these are real classical charges, uh, the ion charges, and the electrons are delocalized, but I'm basically uh, reducing them to a point charge located at the center of the Vani functions. And if they don't coincide, then your electric polarization is given by the distance divided by A. So looking at this expression, you can write it. Uh, so polarization in one dimension has units of charge because uh, the dipole is a charge times distance. And then we divide by distance, so we get a charge. So in units of 2E, it's written as a sum of two dimensional, dimensionless terms. One is the intracell ionic coordinate over A. So let's say this is my unit cell with some lattice constant A. So this would be uh, the tau ionic. So the position of the ionic charge measured from some origin uh, on the unit cell. And this is the uh, Vania center x0. So it's 2e times tau ion over a minus Berry phase over 2 pi, so two dimensional quantities. So this is the celebrated uh, Berry phase polarization formula that uh, was extremely influential in, uh, in the electronic structure community. So people working on ferroelectrics were finally able to compute uh, the basic quantity uh, in the description uh, in the phenomenology of uh, ferroelectric, which is the, the polarization. Uh, so that was quite a, a, a big deal. For a long time, just a few people were excited about it. Uh, but I think uh, other people learned that it's actually <laughs> quite deep. So it really it turned out to play a, a very key role in the, in the theory of uh, topological insulators also, this kind of ideas. So uh, I guess I had in mind implicitly a spontaneous polarization in the absence of any uh, external fields, uh, which you can have in certain, cert certain materials like uh, uh, pyroelectrics, ferroelectrics. But the theory has been extended actually to finite electric fields. So you can handle also finite electric fields and, and compute uh, susceptibilities, linear and nonlinear, applying a similar formalism. But for, in the simplest application, it's spontaneous polarization. Yes. OK. Uh, so this all looks very intuitive and uh, uh, and I guess it is, but maybe uh, a couple of points should be made, which is the first one, the, probably the most important one, is that this is not the same as computing the dipole moment of the charge density in the unit cell. Uh, that is actually, well, it is well defined in this cartoon picture that I drew where the electrons are really point charges, then 
that's okay. But in a real uh, quantum mechanical sense, the electronic cloud is delocalized. And this quantity actually depends on the choice of cell that you made. So if you shift your unit cell a little bit, the dipole of the real uh, continuous distribution of electrons with respect to the positive charge of the ions, you can get any value by uh, computing, by choosing a different cell. So, uh, um, and the reason it's not the same is that uh, when you compute the total charge density at any given point in, let's say, this unit cell here, it has contributions not only from the Vani function that is nominally centered on this cell, but it also has contributions from the tails of the neighboring Vani functions. So, uh, so that's one way of seeing that the two quantities are not the same. Okay. And uh, what I'm claiming, again, without proof, is that it's this expression that, uh, that uh, is physically meaningful. And the other one, one way of seeing that it's not meaningful is precisely by repeating the calculation with a different cell, and you'll find that uh, the values you get will just vary continuously. So, um, so I did mention that uh, uh, the, uh, the Berry phase is, of course, only defined modulo to pi, so there is something funny still about this polarization that is not unique because uh, it, uh, if, you, you, if you recalculate your Berry phase in a different gauge and the value changes by 2 pi, then your polarization changes by 2e or minus 2e. Okay? But that's actually uh, not surprising, not completely surprising, because it already happens at the classical level. So in the Vanier picture, we replace the electronic distribu distribution by point charges. So let's say we have, um, yeah. Let's say we have a crystal like this. an infinite linear chain. So Vanier center, ionic charge. So the intracell dipole moment, as I defined it in terms of the Vanier functions, would be pointing from the negative charge inside the cell to the positive charge. Um, but I might as well place the boundary of my cells in a different way, like this. And if I repeat this motif, I still recover the same, uh, uh, the same chain, right? But now the intracell dipole goes like this, right? And if you compare the two and you divide by the, by, uh, by the lattice constant A, the difference between these two, the difference between this and this is precisely E. And then we should put a factor of two for spin degeneracy, and that gives us the, the quantum that I mentioned. So this, uh, this two pi indeterminacy in the Berry phase polarization is perfectly co consistent with just a very simple cartoon picture of uh, uh, an infinite uh, chain of point positive and negative charges. So uh, it actually makes complete sense. So there is nothing very mysterious about that from this perspective. Okay. Uh, still, it's a little bit bothersome because if you talk to an experimentalist, he will tell you that the spontaneous polarization of Arium titanate is this, not this modulo quantum. So, so what's going on there? Uh, what's going on there is that if you actually look at how experimentalists measure the spontaneous polarization, what they actually do is that they flip the polarization and they look at the current that flows during this process. So actually what is always measured is a change in polarization. Let's say between the perielectric and ferroelectric phase or between the, the two you know, pointing down and pointing up. So in the end, you always measure changes in polarization. So let's say we, we, we recalculate the polarization in a different gauge. And let me call lambda now my parameter, which would be 
the, the phonon coordinate that describes the ferroelectric transition. Uh, and if I do the calculation um, in the original gauge, so they will differ by some by this quantum of polarization. But if I now uh, monitor how the polarization is changing as a function of lambda, then the result is going to be the same with either choice. So I'm now concerned with derivatives of the polarization. And that is independent uh, of, um, of the gauge because they only differ by a constant. When you differentiate with respect to lambda, you get zero. So changes in polarization are completely well defined and that's what you measure. So the net change in polarization uh, when you make a finite change in your parameter lambda, like going between the perielectric and the ferroelectric phase, can be computed in any gauge by monitoring the Berry phase and requiring that it changes smoothly without any 2 pi jump as a function of your lambda. And that's completely uh, well-defined, model of nothing. And that's actually what you measure. So everything is, is fine. I will not have time to go through it, but actually at the mathematical level, if you look at the original paper by uh, uh, King Smith and Vanderbilt, uh, this expression is actually related to a Berry curvature in a two parameter space where one of the axes is your one dimensional K and the second axis is lambda. So now we have a two dimensional hybrid space, K lambda, you can define a curvature there and that's related to this so that's why it's gauge invariance from the mathematical, another way of seeing it uh, from the mathematical point of view. Okay. Uh, any questions about this? So I realize that this, uh, you know, I, I, I ask you to assume many things, uh, but I hope that it was reasonable at least, but please ask me questions if, if it was not. Okay. Uh, then I will come to my last topic, which is the, the quantum anomalous Hall effect. So this is our first example of a measurable quantity, the electric polarization that is related to uh, geometric phases in crystals. Right? And the second example I want to give, because I think it's very relevant for uh, subsequent discussions in the, in the lectures, is uh, the quantum anomalous Hall effect. Which is a mouthful, but we'll break it down. So we're now actually back to the more conventional setting of a two-dimensional Brillouin zone, the one that we've uh, dis discussed several times. So we have our unit cell in real space AB, and then we have our Brillouin zone uh, in reciprocal space. And, uh, and we already know that this is really topologically a torus because of the periodicity of k-space. So this is a two-dimensional closed surface and there is a churn number that we can define. So now our Berry curvature, let's say again, uh, we're talking about the, the single, let's say we have a, a, a system with a single valence band and I'm computing the Berry curvature for that valence band. So it's defined, it's a scalar defined at every point in the Brillouin zone by this expression that should be familiar by now. And uh, if we integrate uh, this over the Brillouin zone and divide by two pi, we are guaranteed by Chern's theorem to get an integer, which is a Chern number.
And for most insulators, this is going to be zero. Uh, but it turns out that uh, you can come up with uh, uh, toy models and even real materials where it's uh, a non-zero integer. And these are called churn insulators or quantum anomalous all insulators. So the first example at the level of toy models was the famous Haldane model, which is on a, a honeycomb lattice. Uh, but it's actually, uh, once he has done it, then it's easy to come up with many examples. So, uh, And uh, I want to rely uh, on something which is the last thing I discussed in the previous lecture, which was the interpretation of the churn number on a torus geometry. So remember that? So the churn number on a torus was given by the winding of the Berry phase along one of the directions. So uh, it's going to be exactly the same thing here. What we're going to do is we're going to split the two-dimensional Brillouin zone into a sequence of one-dimensional strings, let's say along Ky, and each of them is a function of Kx. And for each Kx, I have an effective one-dimensional Brillouin zone where I can define a Zek phase. And the churn number is going to be the winding of this Zek phase along Y, which is labeled by Kx as I cycle Kx from 0 to 2 pi over A. So if that comes back to itself, the churn number is 0. If it changes by 2 pi, the churn number is 1, and so forth. But uh, remembering this equation here, we can think uh, more intuitively of this uh, Zek phase at the, on a given string as a sort of average coordinate along y of the electrons that live on this one-dimensional string of the two-dimensional Brillouin zone. So we have a sort of a hybrid representation where we have a real space coordinate y labeled by kx. Okay? This can be formalized by actually starting from the block functions in two dimensions and then doing the Vanier transformation just along one of the directions, along ky. Uh, and then you integrate over ky, so you no longer have ky as a label. We've integrated that out. You still, you're still left with kx. Uh, but uh, this function is now localized in the vertical direction y. But it's still extended. So it's block-like along x and Vanier-like along y. And its center along y is precisely this Zek phase. So these are uh, sometimes called hybrid Vani functions. So I'm going to define for each of these strings here, a Z phase along Y, which is a function of Kx, and it is the integral dK, well, Y, sorry, of the Berry connection, U dKy U. Okay. And then I define the, the center of this hybrid Vani function, or this effective average coordinate along y, as a function of kx, just, just like we did. So just thinking of this as an effective one-dimensional problem, where the lattice constant is b. So the coordinate is the lattice co is uh, the very phase over to pi in units of the lattice constant. So. And so the winding picture expressed in terms of this coordinate y bar is that if the valence band has a zero churn number, then uh, as we scan uh, kx from zero to two pi over a, this coordinate can change, but it comes back to itself. So that's c equals zero. But uh, uh, if it actually changes by a lattice constant b, 
then, uh, which corresponds to a change in the very phase by 2 pi, then the churn number is 1, and so forth. Okay? So, what is the physical property that uh, is associated with this phenomenon? Uh, well, I will just first write the result and then, uh, and then provide uh, an heuristic proof. But uh, it's, the, it's, a, it's a type of Hall effect. So let's say we apply an electric field along X. And my claim is that uh, when the churn number is non-zero, you're going to get uh, a current flowing along Y. And the relation between the induced current and the applied electric field is okay. So the ratio between a two-dimensional current and the field is a conductance. So dimensional, in terms of dimensions, this makes sense because e square over h is the quantum of conductance. And then the claim is that the prefactor is this integer churn number c. So. Uh, to summarize, an insulator, a two-dimensional insulator, can have uh, a whole response, uh, but then the, the whole conductivity must be quantized in units of the quantum of conductance, and, uh, and, uh, and the Chern number gives you the actual conductivity in those units. So, so this is very much like the integer Hall effect, with a very important difference that we don't have any magnetic field here, so we just have an electric field. And that's where the name anomalous comes from, in the sense of spontaneous without, without magnetic field. So there is only an electric field applied. So this is the quantum anomalous Hall effect. Okay. Uh, so I will provide the. Uh, an heuristic justification for this formula. Yes, please. Uh, that C also, I mean, are we looking at two from the center of the field or is it Ah, you're right. So actually, you're absolutely right. So uh, if, if there was spin degeneracy, there should be a two. So I guess I'm assuming spinless electrons right now because I guess I'm, so for example, the Haldane model is, it's a spinless model, so. But you're right, yes, so. Um, if you had spin degenerate bands, then, uh, then you should put a two. <laughs> Typically, so in real systems, then you have spin orbit and uh, you break time reversal. So actually, the bands um, split. You don't have spin degeneracy, but anyway, let's let's assume a spinless electrons. So. Uh, The way to justify this equation in simple terms is to remember from the semi-classical equations of motion that uh, if you apply for wave packets in crystals, if you apply an electric field, you change the crystal momentum. Okay, so let's say that we apply an electric field along x, like in this cartoon, the wave vector kx is going to be changing. So in this hybrid representation, you sort of see now what's happening because uh, your electrons in, so this is a hybrid space, real space Y, reciprocal space X. You apply the electric field along X, and uh, the electrons are moving in this axis, like so, but then their vertical coordinate Y is changing, okay? And after one block oscillation, so after the time that it takes to go from one side of the real zone to the other, the vertical, the Y coordinate has changed by a lattice constant. And if you, well, we can do the numbers, so you'll see that you get precisely that coefficient if you plug in the numbers, so we can do it quickly. So we want to consider what happens after a change. So let's say the electric field is applied in the positive x direction. So there is a minus sign here. So my E is positive, is the elementary charge. So K is changing in the negative direction. So the, 
the Brillouin zone, the delta kx over the full Brillouin zone is minus 2 pi over a. So, and it takes a certain time, which is the block oscillation time delta t. Uh, and delta t is h bar e a electric field x. And over this time, the y coordinate has changed. So now you have to be careful with the signs. So the electric field is along x. The electrons are moving in this direction. So if the chair number is 1, the coordinate changed by minus b. So we started here and we went down. So if the chair number is c, it changed by minus cb. So the average velocity that you can uh, uh, construct out of this uh, for the electrons is the net change in coordinate over a block period over the that time delta t. And what you get uh, is minus c e h a b. E x. So that's a. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So now I want to go from a velocity to a current, so I need to multiply by a charge density. So I have, so again, spin is electron. So I have one electron minus E, charge minus E, over a unit cell of area A times B. And I multiply this by the average velocity during this uh, oscillation, the velocity induced by the electric field. And what I get is precisely plus C e squared over H EX, which is what I claimed uh, somewhere here. Okay. So, um, yeah, so in this case, uh, the external parameter that is changing K is the electric field, and you can worry about how good the adiabatic approximation is. So that was a question that came up at the very first lecture that I gave. But uh, if you, if you uh, look at this equation, then you don't worry so much, because the rate of change of K is proportional to the electric field, and uh, we are basically doing linear response here, right? So we want a current induced at first order in the field, so we can make the field as small as we want. So as far as linear response is concerned, we, we can make the electric field as small as we want, and then the rate of change of K is small, and then there is the adiabatic approximation works well, because this is an insulator, there is a gap, so uh, we can always uh, approach the regime where this approximation holds. Um, okay. So this quantity here is our whole conductivity. And if we remember this expression for the churn number, then we can write formally this anomalous hole conductivity for an insulator. So which I defined as Jy over Ex as e squared, there is a 2 pi here, so 2 pi h, and then the integral over the Brillouin zone of the uh, Berry curvature. So 
So the polarization gave us an example of a physical observable associated with the Berry phase. And the quantum anomalous effect in two-dimensional insulators is an example of an observable associated with the churn number, which in turn is uh, expressible as the Berry curvature. Okay? Uh, the very last thing, so how much time do I have? Uh, okay, so I will finish before. So the very last thing I want to mention to come full circle is what happens if, so here I have some valence band, some conduction band, there is a gap, and the Fermi level lies somewhere here. So this is the churn number of my valence band, let's say it's plus one. So, uh, and now I want to ask the question what happens if now uh, my band is, let's say, half filled, so the Fermi level cuts through the band. So I no longer have an insulator, but I have a metal. Uh, what's going to happen to this uh, anomalous hall conductivity? So, um, so now what I want to do is to uh, define, introduce an occupation number, so the Fermi occupation, so at t equals zero is just zero and one, and it drops sharply at the Fermi surface. So this is the occupied region of the Brion zone, and this is the empty region. And so for the insulator, the entire Brion zone was occupied, and you obtain the whole conductivity by integrating the curvature over the entire Brion zone. So what we we're going to do for a metal is do the same, but we just restrict the integral over the occupied region, okay? So now, uh, occupied region of the Brion zone. Okay, so I think it looks quite plausible. Uh, uh, but so, well, what can we do here? We can apply our favorite trick, which is Stokes' theorem. Right, so the curvature is the curl of the connection. We're integrating the curvature over this region enclosed by boundary, one-dimensional boundary, so the integral of the curvature over the surface enclosed by this boundary is equal to the integral of the connection around the boundary, okay? So we get this uh, beautiful result, which is that the anomalous hole conductivity of a metal is given in units of the quantum of conductance e square over h by the Berry phase over 2 pi. And what is the contour of integration? Is the Fermi surface, which, okay, since we are in two dimensions, it's not a surface, it's a, it's a loop, okay? One subtlety is that uh, for the insulator, uh, the formula gave us the anomalous hall conductivity precisely for a metal, if you apply this formula here, in terms of the, of the Berry phase, the Berry phase is only defined modulo to pi, so this gives you the anomalous hull conductivity, which is, uh, can be whatever, so if you shrink the Fermi surface, this number will change continuously, but it gives you the right answer only modulo e square over h, because the Berry phase is only defined modulo to pi. So the Fermi surface formula for the anomalous hull conductivity gives you the non-quantized part, if you want, of the anomalous hull conductivity, okay? So, yeah, so I think this is a good place where to end because uh, there it is, a physical observable associated with the, uh, the Berry phase on a loop in the two-dimensional Brion zone. So, yeah, so actually that's all I had to say. Let me just, uh, to conclude, to, to tell you where you can get the, the notes. So I posted them on, on a link on my web page. So this is all lowercase, but I'll write the URL in uppercase so that it becomes more readable. So cfm.ehu. Maybe if someone has a computer, you can check that I'm doing it right. That es slash my first name, Ivo slash uh, 
lectures, not PDF. So that should give you the full set of notes. So are there any questions about this? Yes. Add up, yeah. You have to be careful with the holes. You should do the circulation in the opposite direction. But yes, that's right. You can also, uh, so this is for two-dimensional systems. And of course, uh, uh, the anomalous cell conductivity has been measured mostly in bulk metals, three-dimensional metals. So this, is, can all, this can all be generalized to three dimensions. Um, and you can actually do the, this. Actually, one way of doing it is you take the, three-dimensional Brion zone, you slice it into two-dimensional slices, and on each of those, the intersection of the slice with the, with the two-dimensional Fermi surface is one-dimensional loops, and then you do the very phases on those loops, and you add up the results from all the slices, and you get the three-dimensional and almost all conductivity. Right. Uh, well, so that was the whole discussion on the literature on the anomalous cell conductivity. So this, you're right, so this is not the full story. So uh, this is what's called the intrinsic anomalous cell conductivity in the sense that uh, uh, it's called intrinsic because it's a property of the pristine band structure and there is no scattering time here. And then there are some other contributions uh, 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 associated with scattering from impurities. Skew scattering, the conductivity contains uh, the scattering time, and then there is this side jump, which is quite uh, mysterious, which also does not depend on tau, even though it is extrinsic. So uh, there was a whole discussion over many decades, actually. Uh, and I think it was, to a big uh, extent, thanks to the ab initio calculations of this intrinsic contribution to simple ferromagnetic metals like iron, cobalt, and nickel, uh, that established that um, the numbers you get out from that can be actually very close to the experimental result, at least in the dirty limit. Uh, so there are regimes where this contribution is actually important. So uh, it's clear by now that, so the story is complicated, you're right, but it's clear that this contribution can be important in many situations. Well, there is a unique answer. If you calculate it as a, as a Fermi surface property, there is this quantum of indeterminacy. But uh, if you integrate the Berry curvature over the Fermi C, you get a unique answer for this intrinsic contribution. It's not quantized, you're right. Uh, but that's what you should compare with the experiment. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, you can you can know uh, the entire value by doing the Fermi C calculation in terms of the curvature. Yes, the entire value of the intrinsic contribution. Not just model to pi. Yes. <laughs> so if you use this expression, so this expression gives you the result model of nothing. It's this one. It's when you go from here to there that you introduce the quantum of indeterminacy because you went from a curvature, which is gauge invariant, to a phase. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit mysterious, right? Because this is a DC transport coefficient and you would expect it to be uh, a Fermi surface property uh, from the Landau Fermi liquid theory. Uh, and it looks like, at least in terms of the bulk Fermi surface, uh, you can only get it model uh, quantum. This is something that uh, Haldane has, I think, thought a lot about. Uh, I think he had some ideas that maybe looking at the Fermi arcs, you could resolve the quantum. 
But okay, we are getting on deep waters. <laughs> That's correct, yes. So, yeah. right. So, if you do like for the Haldane model, uh, if you imagine uh, scanning. The, the result of this computation, uh, let's say sigma normal all in unit of uh, um, e square over h, so uh, it will go up and then it will plateau at the quantized value when you're, so as a function of the chemical potential, as you said. So as, you, as you're cutting through the band, it goes up and then it plateaus at e square over h. That's right. Yes, right, right. Uh, if you have a, a valence band with a zero churn number, but that does break time reversal symmetry, like at certain portions of the phase diagram of the Haldane model, what you're going to get instead is that uh, uh, as the chemical potential cuts through the band, the anomalous cell quantity becomes non-zero, but as you approach the gap, it goes back to zero. So in that case, in the insulating limit, you get zero for the anomalous cell conductivity. Yeah. Did anyone check the URL? Does it work? Okay. 